when love goes wrong, it can be a dangerous game. Jealousy consumes a woman and spits out a killer. He was tossing her aside. This was not tolerable. Best friends conspire to destroy a rival. It was what I call a frenzied attack. And a jilted wife takes lethal revenge. That's like setting off a bomb. It's like shooting the high power rifle. Cross these deadly women at your peril. They kiss, then kill. Nothing will kill a relationship faster than jealousy. Hey. Was like pouring gasoline on the proverbial fire. That's the time when everyone should have left. Robin O'Neill knows all about the real estate market in Townsend, Vermont. She's one of the elected property listers. The listers have a very important job of maintaining and assessing the properties for tax value throughout the year. Howdy. Hey, Steve. Hi, Robin. I brought the brochure if you look at. Thanks. We'll sit down. In 2013, Robin is interested in the value of one particular property. You've undervalued my home. The market's a little slow at the moment. Don't tell me about the market. It's my job. She decided that she was going to move from Vermont to Texas to live with her sister. No. Redo the photos. The lighting is all wrong. The move to small town Vermont hasn't worked out for the 62-year-old divorcee from Texas. Robin did not make friends easily. She was a little standoffish. Many thought her behavior indicated that she thought she was better than everyone else in town. Uh, she was difficult to get along with. I think that ended up uh, leading to her uh, departure. Ooh, save me! <laughs> but one colleague, 60-year-old Steve Lott, finds this feisty woman intriguing. It is not funny. <laughs> it is. You are. <laughs> Anybody home? In here. Oh, Steve, thank you. No, happy to help. Stephen assisted Robin in packing up her belongings so she could move to Texas. You'll be sorry. They say opposites attract, and that certainly happened here. Stephen was very much liked in the community, loved even, gregarious, friendly. Put it back. <laughs> really? Robin was none of those things. You met any cowboys lately? As if. The odd couple are about to discover absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> Stephen was calling her all the time, and she was giggling on the phone like some schoolgirl. Stop it. Her sister couldn't believe how much time they spent on the phone and how they were just like little teenagers. <laughs> the couple decide there's only one thing to do. Why don't you come back to Vermont? Oh, and live where? Robin should come back to her old job with a new fiancé. Okay. Steve was likely looking for companionship. Yeah, we'll talk soon. His three children were grown up, and Robin was able to provide that to him. Everything started out really well. They were getting along. They were loving being together. <laughs> to Robin and Steve. Stephen delights in sharing his fiance with friends and loved ones. You see my engagement ring? Very nice. So when's the wedding? And don't forget we got that fishing trip coming. Oh, there's no way I'd miss that. <laughs> he was very friendly, very outgoing, had a lot of friends like to hang out with his kids and, and his friends.
friends. What? We will talk later. But Robin doesn't like sharing her man. I'll get some more drinks. Excuse me. She wasn't a heavy person. She changed the way that their father was, as far as being able to hang out with his friends and family. Eventually, they felt unwelcome visiting their father because of Robin's behavior and mouth. Steve learns to keep his bride to be happy. She needs his undivided attention. <laughs> so there's more trouble when one of his oldest friends, Adair, hey! returns to town. I didn't know you were back. Thought I would surprise you. Uh, sorry, Adair. This is my fiance, Robin. Really? <laughs> Congratulations. You got yourself a good man. So Stephen and Adair were friends for 25 years because they lived right around the corner from each other. Adair was a very close friend and was very attractive. It's so great to see you. Robin just didn't find that appropriate. <laughs> She thought that men should not have women friends. <laughs> How's that? And just then. It all fell apart. I mean, she was a jealous person. She was very jealous of Steve, you know, when he would talk to his friends, especially if it was a female friend. Because she perceived her as a threat. Truth is, if Adair and Stephen were ever going to be together, it would have happened years before. They were just friends. Robin was so certain that he was having an affair with Adair that she started stalking the both of them and following him. Obsessed, Robin keeps a detailed diary of Steve's every move with his friend. That is insecurity on steroids. This significantly put a lot of pressure or a lot of strain on Robin's relationship with Steve. It comes to a head the night Robin confronts Steve with a weapon. What are you doing? Get back here! Stephen's 9mm was kept in the bedside stand. Stephen was so rattled when he saw Robin open the bedside table. He thought she was going to get a gun, and he left. He got up and went down to Adair's house. She tried to shoot me. Stephen didn't feel safe in his own home, so he ran to his friend Adair. I don't think that sat very well with Robin. November 18th, 2014, in Townsend, Vermont. Romance is dead. The relationship is disintegrating, it's falling apart. There are issues of jealousy, there are issues of trust. Stephen Lott has had enough. Robin and Stephen didn't have a long enough history together for him to be more forgiving of her bad behavior. The engagement's off. He just said to her, we are disengaged. And that was it, he wanted her to move out. Well, Robin didn't take that well at all. And in fact, she was absolutely furious. Her, isn't, it? isn't it? Get out. Things are about to get messy around the office. He was tossing her aside. This was not tolerable. Can I have a word in private? Robin plans to get even. Robin actually displayed to a friend bruises that she claimed Stephen gave her. It's Steve. He's been abusing me. Robin, that's dreadful. Her friend said, do you want me to take photos? Robin said, no, it's never going to happen again. And things are no better.
were at home. There was a lot of drinking. <laughs> that was one hell of a trend. <laughs> Hi, James. My machine was broken again. Oh, yeah. Any excuse to save me? I'm going to put it on. Steve's son, 28-year-old Jameis, arrives to find a dysfunctional family. Jameis had come over to the house to do his laundry. Robin hit on one of Stephen's friends. So, the engagement is off. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, now I'm free to sleep with you. That's not happening. You rejected her. When she got rebuffed, she went upstairs and started breaking things, making a lot of noise. That's the time when everyone should have left. That night, Robin snaps. She picks up her gun and shoots Jameis in the back of the head. Then she turns a gun on Stephen. Robin! Robin, stop! And starts firing. Robert O'Neill shot Steve 12 different times. There were seven shots to the head, one shot to the chest, and four shots to the groin area. This is it. In return for love and companionship, Steve loses his son and his life. After murdering the men in cold blood, I just shot Steve and his son. Robin phones a friend. She reported that Steve is in a pool of blood by my feet and Jameis is in a separate pool of blood underneath the table. And calmly ties up loose ends. And I need you to mind my dog. She was concerned about her dog. She wanted to make sure her colleague would agree to take care of her dog. She appeared to be more concerned about her dog than uh, the fact that she had just shot and killed uh, two people. Get down! Though she's planted a series of domestic abuse allegations, Robin blows it on that fateful night. The battered woman defense may have carried some weight if she hadn't killed a totally innocent person that had nothing to do with her. In 2017, Robin O'Neill is found guilty of two counts of aggravated murder and sentenced to life in prison. No possibility of parole. And she was certainly very remorseful that Jameis is dead, but she's never taken any responsibility for killing Steve. Steve and Lot only ever wanted the best for his family, his friends, and his new love. Robin returned his affection with paranoia, jealousy, and rage. Robin wanted to kill Stephen for not attending to her the way she wanted. It was pure jealousy. It's a crime of obsession and barbarity. One of the most brutal ever seen between women. Two thousand thirteen, in the sleepy upscale village of Helmshore, England. Thirty-two-year-old Sarah Williams meets up with her unlikely BFF. 53-year-old Kit Walsh. Wow. She was a biker and she was 20 years older than Sarah. Sarah and Kit were an odd couple to be sure. Sarah used men for what they could do for her. And that means dollar signs. How are you? I'm good. You look wonderful though. <laughs> she could get men to love her. And lost after her, and she loved every moment of it. The pair's favorite male target is a 75-year-old who's been supporting Sarah 
have since she was a teenager. Naomi, can you help me? You've got to go to Daddy's here. Hey, how are you? She didn't want to let David go because he was writing the checks. She saw him very much as a sugar daddy. Here you go, your favorite. Thank you. But he was married to someone else. Did you ski today? I blitzed it. This is my girl. But this would be more fun. Not only did he see to it she had a lavish lifestyle. Let me convince you. <laughs> he actually put money in her account every week just so she could have fun. Why don't you sleep over? You know I can't. Anything that she wanted, you know, within reason, she'd get. She kind of never had to make it to. Everything was there. It's open. I rushed to it. Oh, no, what's up? How's the trip to Switzerland sound? <sighs> really? While Sarah doesn't want for money. Is David Payne? Of course. You can get a man to do whatever you want. <sighs> Not everything. Her closest friend knows she longs for something else. In Kent, she had someone she could talk to, and she could say things that she wouldn't share with anybody else. For Sarah, sex is easy. Love is more elusive. Until she meets yet another new man, 57-year-old Ian Johnston. Ian Johnston was a fireman, he was an expert skier. Very soon they struck up a relationship. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I'm seeing someone. I can't. It's alright. It can be our little secret. When Sarah met Ian, things were different. Sarah is falling in love. But the feeling isn't mutual. Sarah and Ian didn't even go out. Same time next week. Sorry, no can do. Sadie and I are going away. Ian had been with Sadie, another woman, for a long time, and he loved her. What he felt for Sarah was quite a bit more base. Ian's two worlds are about to collide on a skiing trip to France. Yeah, tell from the top. <laughs> Ian and 58-year-old Sadie Hartley aren't expecting guests. Yeah? Something strong? Ian! Yeah, that'd be good. I don't believe it! This is Ian, an old family. I hate my old family. Oh, my nice to meet. Nice to meet. David. Despite her love for Ian, Sarah's kept her sugar daddy. The bizarre nature of this relationship culminated in probably the awkward holiday anyone could ever imagine. Sarah played footsie under the table as they were all enjoying dinner together. But when Sarah finally gets Ian alone, she's in for bad news. No more. You and I are over. Because of her? Yes. I love her. You're choosing that old woman over me? I think you'd better leave. She wanted to be the one controlling that relationship. She didn't like it when Ian took over. She wasn't somebody to be messed with in the slightest. If you hurt her, if you ended a relationship, you could expect to come back. You regret this. They say there's nothing like a, a woman scorned, but Sarah Williams was the epitome of that. In Helmshore, England, Sarah Williams won't accept she's lost her lover to a rival. Infuriated, Sarah writes a letter to Sadie outlining every sordid detail of her affair, even down to the type of sex they have. 
she'll dump him when she reads that. It shows in that letter the kind of controlling, obsessive element of, of Sarah Williams. She hopes to break up longtime partners Sadie Hartley and Ian Johnston. I promise it's over. Sadie was undeterred by this explicit letter written to her by Sarah. She's not going to destroy us. Ian became more dedicated to Sadie, and it blew up in Sarah's face. Sarah refused to accept that any other woman could have him. It was her or no one. Sarah has a plan. This one will do. I need your credit card. Sure. And BFF Kit Walsh is right by her side. Sarah was really the dominant one in that friendship. When Sarah suddenly raised this idea, Kit went along with it. It's arrived. The duo go online shopping. They planted a GPS tracker on Ian's car so they could follow his movements. You need someone to make sure you don't get hurt. Good idea. If Sadie went for them, they could use the stun gun to incapacitate her. Kit documents everything. Kit gets swept along in a tide of emotion as she writes down all the details of Sarah's plan to kill Sadie in her diary. After more than a year of planning, on January 14th, 2016, the women are ready. They know exactly where Ian is. Away from home. Leaving Sadie all alone. the eight inch knife went all the way in to the body that is a measure of the anger that she felt towards this woman it's done I get it. while Sarah goes home to clean up Kit has one job destroy the evidence for all of sarah's resourcefulness in killing someone you know what to do they'll never find them giving all the evidence to kit to get rid of was the dumbest thing she ever did the boots the knife the stun gun and the diary are all hidden very clumsily by kit and the pair fail to cover their digital tracks. When Sadie's body is discovered, suspicion falls on Ian's obsessed ex-lover. Her cell phone is traced to the crime scene the night of the murder. Cell phones have been putting people in prison for 20 years, but apparently Sarah didn't get the memo. A search reveals the damning evidence Kit failed to hide effectively. Besides the stun gun and the knife, they also start to read the diary, which reveals a 17-month plan of action when it came to the death of Sadie. Don't move! You're under arrest! Give me a hand. Come here. 
Their so-called cover-up has been an unmitigating disaster. In 2016, Sarah Williams and Katrina Kit Walsh are found guilty of murder. Kit is sentenced to life with a minimum of 25 years behind bars. Kit's role in this murder was minuscule compared to what Sarah's was, but she's paying for it just the same. Sarah is sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years. The attack on Sadie was one of the most brutal I've ever seen between women. Sarah's unrequited love led to the violent destruction of an innocent life. Sadie was a successful businesswoman. She was a mother, by all accounts, of a very loving, kind-hearted woman with not a bad bone in her body. This was a crime of obsession and barbarity. But this is also a crime that's pure in its motivation. It was... year-old Ron Rico is gravely injured. The victim of a hit and run. Rico! Rico! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What happened? But Ashley's in for an even bigger shock. Who did this? You did that, Ashley. That's when everything kind of came crashing down. Oh, I, I, I had no idea. What happened, sir? She didn't know I was going to lie to her. She drove her over me. It was a mistake. Boy, I drove! One year earlier, Ashley and Ron Rico are on a high. They had a huge wedding. For them, it was symbolic of a fresh start. A new life for both bride and groom. A time to forget struggles of the past. This is us. It is grand. It is big. It is wonderful. And this is going to be us forever. Both Ashley and Rodrigo bring children to the marriage. And they waste no time having one of their own. That the two had found happiness together. <laughs> you go and have your hands full, girl. <laughs> We're gonna be alright, Mom. <laughs> We're gonna be alright. They were living together in a home that was owned by Ronrico's mother. New love, full of hope. Ronrico and Ashley are confident they will make it. She was very active in that community. Really? She seemed like everything was on the up. Okay, great. Thank you. Ashley had a job and was making good money, but Ron Rico didn't. Yes! He stayed home and took care of their daughter. I got it. I got a job! <laughs> I think this was a problem for her. The newlyweds begin to discover hidden truths about each other. I don't understand why he needed new shoes this month. Would you be saying that if it was your son? That's the thing, Rico. He ain't my kid. Actually, you know what? Give me my baby. Just chill. Excuse chill. you? The 
Eternal Bliss machine didn't last more than a few months before they were at each other's throats. She doesn't even know who her mama is anyway. Well, her mama is the one that's keeping the spirit safe. Ashley Schutz was quick to anger, and when she angered, she became violent. around to observe her horrible behavior. Her children, other people's children, witnesses to a crime, didn't matter. I've had it, Mom. I can't do this anymore. But Ashley doesn't take responsibility. She blames her violence on others. Honey, give it some time. Marriage takes work. Work? Rico does not know the meaning of the word. Be honest now. Have you been losing your temper? Losing my temper? What is that supposed to mean, Mom? Whose side are you on anyway? Ashley's mother was talking with her about her temper, and Ashley told her mother that one time she was holding the baby, and Ron Rico punched her several times in the face. He bashes me all the time. that at all. Ronrico upholds his wedding vows for better or worse. Ronrico began to see Ashley as crazy. His wife starts attacking him publicly. As people do to celebrate the long weekend, people were drinking and carrying on. The two started arguing during the day, and, and the argument carried on throughout the afternoon. Give it to me. Whoa, chill, baby, chill. It's a party. As more drinks were consumed, the argument got more heated. Ronrico has had enough. Ronrico threatened to end the marriage. It's over, Ashley. We're done. Give her to me. No! Ashley was enormously upset at the idea of the marriage breaking up. There's an argument over who's going to take the child. She's my child too, you know. It says so on the birth certificate. Say what? Rodrigo points out that he's the one who signed the birth certificate. It's his child as well as hers. Rodrigo is playing with fire. Give it to me! And strangely, 
Ronrico keeps their secret. Barely conscious and paralyzed, he is rushed to the hospital. He had a fractured neck, in other words, unable to move, and he had to have a breathing tube because of all of the fractured bones in his chest and arms and neck. Ron Rico told his mother what he originally told the cops, but that Ashley had backed over by accident was not true. She ran it down. What? And that she meant to hit him, and she hit him from the front. I'm going straight don't to the police. He also told her, please don't go to the cops with this. He didn't want the mother of his child in jail, so he protected her. He was thinking of the kids, not himself. Ronrico is extra cautious because this isn't his wife's first offense. Pull out my hands, one! You're crazy! The father of her two previous children had upset her one time. Ah! And she rammed into the back of his car with the front of hers. I got you now! She hit it with a large amount of force. 2005, she had been convicted of misdemeanor assault, domestic violence. I got you! What's wrong with you? He didn't want her to go to jail again. Ronrico's mother keeps her promise until 11 days later. He went into septic shock as a result of the multiple severe injuries that he suffered and then passed away. When he died, all bets were off. My son, Ron Schutz, was murdered, and I know who did it. It was his wife. Charlotte came forward and said that this is what Ron Rico said really happened. So that's the moment the investigation changed. The police finally opened up an investigation. Based on her story, they proceeded to court. With testimony from the child witness, a jury is convinced Ronrico's death is no accident. He was in the neighborhood of 300 pounds and over 60 feet tall. He was a large man. I would think you would know if you ran over him. In 2017, Ashley Schutz is convicted of murder and felonious assault. She's sentenced to life with a minimum of 15 years. Ashley is right where she needs to be for the rest of us to be safe. She turned the family car into a deadly weapon. Somebody can't control their anger, and when they get mad, they lash out. That's always going to be a problem for them. She's a dangerous person and always will be. These deadly women didn't know the meaning of love. Robin O'Neill's jealousy destroyed a family. Kit Walsh and Sarah Williams mutilated a love rival. And Ashley Shute's rage killed her husband. All three women were green with envy. They bathed their anger in blood. When they kiss, then kill.